guys, so thank you for joining us for our Leadership Summit portion. Um, I want to introduce you to very special people who are going to be leading this for us. Um, first, we have Diana Martinelli, who is our Associate Dean. Diana Martinelli is a Widemeyer Professor in Public Relations and Associate Dean in the W.U. Reed College of Media. She earned her PhD in Mass Communication from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and was the PRSSA Faculty Advisor at Ohio University before joining WVU in 2005. She's a longtime member of PRSA and has served on national committees for the organization, as well as judge the Bateman competition and silver and bronze anvil awards. For the last three years, she has helped select the PR stu Week Student of the Year. Dr. Martinelli worked in radio, healthcare, and government public relations before returning to school for her doctorate. Since then, she has continued to cons consult and collaborate on public communication pro projects while teaching and conducting research. She has been an advisory board member of the Planck Center of Leadership in Public Relations since 2012, and in 2014 was elected for membership in the Arthur W. Page Society, a professional association of senior corporate communicator, communications professionals and educators who seek to enrich the profession. She's a graduate of the nine-month Leadership West Virginia program, the Scripps Howard Academic Leadership Academy, and is a participant in and presenter for the WVU Women's Leadership Initiative. In her spare time, she serves as the handler for the Reed College of Media's therapy dog, Omega, <laughs> and as the president of the Mountaineer State Rotary Club. We also have with us Eric Wingfield. Yeah. Eric M. Wingfield is a skilled communicator with a myriad of experience. He's continuously evolving in the changing media and technology landscapes. He joined Pepco, a public utility owned by Exelon that provides service to customers in Washington, D.C. and to surrounding communities in Maryland as a communication specialist and was promoted to public affairs after a year. As a communication specialist and spokesperson for Pepco Holdings, he was responsible for developing, managing, and implementing integrated communication strategies that supported the company's objectives. He is adept at targeting a variety of diverse audiences through earned and owned media. In his role as a public affairs manager, Wingfield is charged with aiding the company in advancing community outreach, public policy, and stakeholder engagement strategies for the District of Columbia. As an experienced communications professional with a demonstrate history of working in complex industries, he is skilled in media strategies, public affairs, integrated marketing communications, and market research. Prior to joining Pepco, Wingfield held roles with companies such as Edelman, NBC Universal, Universal Pictures, and West Virginia University. Wingfield received his Bachelor's of Science in Public Relations from Florida A&M University and his Master's in Science in Integrated Marketing and Communications at West Virginia University. He is an active member of the Public Relations Society of America. While in college, he served as the National Committee of PRSSA as the Vice President of Advocacy. During his term, he led national programming on ethics, diversity, and inclu inclusion for the society. Um, for that, us now, that is now the VP of External Affairs for anyone at PRSSA. Yeah. He is passionate about advocating and helping others grow to become their best and authentic selves. In 2018, he received the Emerging Leader Award from the Planck Center for Leadership in Public Relations, in public relations for his unwavering commitment to mentoring. Wingfield is a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, serves on the Board of Advisors for After School All-Stars DC, and a graduate of Leadership Montgomery County. So I'd like to welcome our speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such an honor to be here. I have to apologize. I do not have Omega the therapy dog with me today. <laughs> However, she will be here tomorrow. We won't hold it against you today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, it's really an honor to be here, not only to represent the Reed College of Media, but also to represent the Planck Center for Leadership and Public Relations. Um, I actually knew Betsy Planck. She passed away in 2012, 2010, and I served on some national level committees with her for PRSA. This is her picture right there on my lapel. This is one of her brooches as well. Um, if you're not familiar with Betsy, you've probably heard something about her, but just a dynamo of a woman. Um, she was an executive vice president in the 1940s to Dan Edelman, mm -hmm. uh, what became Edelman, of course, public relations. She also was an executive for public relations of AT&T back in the 1940s, first public relations society of America president in yeah. the early 1970s, and also considered the godmother of PRSSA. Um, she was one of the driving forces behind the creation of PRSSA. And really, you guys were her heart. I mean, that is what she was passionate about. Mm -hmm. And she left that legacy, left her estate to the University of Alabama um, to help facilitate continued leadership development in the field and to help continue to support you guys. So I really encourage you, if you have not checked them out, gotten on LinkedIn, 
uh, gone to the web page and all there are resources there for you. Um, so let me start, Eric and I wanted to begin this by talking a little bit about our respective individual leadership journeys. So you might be surprised if I were to say, I believe my leadership journey and your leadership journeys have a lot in common, despite the generational difference. So let me ask you a question. Wait for the full questions kind of long before you raise your hand, okay? So think back to kindergarten through middle school. How many of you were a member of a sports team, maybe soccer, you know, basketball, maybe you did gymnastics? Maybe you were uh, a member of student government, of scouts, of 4-H, of the band. How many of you were a member of a group or a team, kindergarten through junior high? Let me see your hand. Okay. Yeah, I'm not surprised. The Planck Center for Readership commissioned some research internationally. They spoke with PR professionals, 23 different countries, about 4,600 PR professionals. And they identified six specific leadership dimensions in the field of public relations, regardless of what country you were involved in. One of those, team collaboration. Right? So you think back to being a member of that group, you were already beginning to hone the seeds of leadership by learning to work together, right? by having a larger goal of which you were trying to, to work toward. Another one of those leadership dimensions, relationship building. How many of you have siblings? Okay. So you're constantly, right, negotiating, compromising, learning to work out issues. Or maybe you were the one in your clique who was always the peacemaker, right? Or maybe you're the one who is reaching out, nurturing relationships. Maybe you've got friends, but you're the one who always reaches out first, right? Relationship building, starting at a young age. Um, another one. Self-dynamics. This was the third leadership dimension that they identified across countries. So what does that mean? That means being able to control your emotions. It's part of uh, emotional intelligence, and we're going to talk a little bit about that later. But really being able to know appropriate behavior, right, to maintain poise. When we're little, when we're babies, we get uncomfortable, we don't get our way, we just cry. Right? But no one wants to be around a leader who gets emotional and just cries, right? Who's, I used to work for a woman. I didn't work for her very long because it was <laughs> not one that I, a leadership style that I appreciated. It was not the, the culture for me. But she literally, every day, would run down the hall, crisis, <laughs> right? Crisis du jour. So if there's a crisis every day, there's really never a crisis, right? She's a very emotional, very volatile person. Self-dynamics is being able to understand yourself and to control those kinds of emotions. Okay. Another one is strategic decision-making. Now, I did some research with a colleague at Central Michigan University, funded by the Planck Center, and we found that, as we said, leadership is seated in childhood. We looked at professionals from in India, in China, in Russia, in the U.S., and there's one more, India, China, Russia, Brazil. And that we were looking to see how does leadership evolve. And again, we saw all of them said we've got these seeds in, in uh, our youth, seeds very early. Um, but strategic decision making seemed to develop later. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? You start to become strategic, to have a vision, to see the bigger picture, to not only have a 360 degree view now, but anticipate what's coming in the future after you've had some experience, right? After you've been steeped in that. Another thing that is seated, though, in childhood, fifth leadership dimension, ethical orientation. If you think about your own values, right, you start from your family, teachers, church, right? You start to develop a sense of right and wrong and ethics. And then the last leadership dimension, this, this should be six, is communication knowledge and management. And that's what you guys are doing right now in your undergraduate degrees, right? You're learning how to communicate with audiences through the right media, with the right messages to resonate with them. So those were the six leadership dimensions, again, started early in childhood. And I'll tell you some additional research that the Planck Center has funded. Um, my, my colleague and I asked award-winning millennial PR professionals, 
So these were professionals who were aged like 25 to late 30s who had been recognized by their state, regionally or nationally, as the Young Professional of the Year. And the one thing that they had most in common was participation in PRSSA and or PRSA in terms of their success. So you guys are already well on your way, <laughs> you right, are. for leadership development. But I'll tell you, it's just like professional development. It's lifelong learning, right? You continue to learn and to immerse yourself in leadership development, just as you do in the profession. Uh, there's a saying that said leaders are born, great leaders are born, not made. I think great leaders are born with maybe certain personality characteristics that help them be successful, but they are absolutely made as well. And so the practice that you are getting now, the experience, the formal learning, the informal learning, the TED Talks, the blogs, the books, mm -hmm. all contribute to your success. So you guys are already leaders, and I can just see you're just going to continue to grow. So congrats on that. I now am going to turn to Eric, who's going to share a more personal leadership journey. You know, you heard his bio. He's only 25. He's done all <laughs> these things, right? And, you know, he was a PRSSA leader. I was. And he's already been recognized nationally. So I think you're going to find his story particularly interesting. Eric. Great. Thank you, Doc. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, you can say good evening back, Mr. Doc. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. So if you haven't noticed already, I have a lot of energy, and I really love the feed off the energy of the crowd. So if you just stick with me and stick with Dr. Martinelli and I, I think you will really get a lot out of our presentation this evening. So please take out your phones, take out your pen, take out your paper. Um, we have really worked hard to bring some nuggets that we really hope that you all will take with you, and not only just keep them for yourself, but also share them with your chapters, because you all are chapter leaders. You all are leaders in your own right, and so we want, we want to make sure we share the wealth, share the knowledge, so everybody can grow as well, right? Right? Okay, so you all are really quiet, so just know we're going to be engaging. This is not going to be just Dr. Martinelli and I talking to you, right, Doc? We're going to be really trying to get some, get some of your feedback as well. Um, so Dr. Martinelli um, really introduced me and uh, really set the tone. And, and before I move on, I want to say I'm really honored to be here to have the opportunity to speak to each and every one of you. I do not take this opportunity lightly, and I'm even more honored to share the stage with the wonderful Dr. Martinelli. So can we just please give her a hand, because she is awesome. Um, so my story, here it is. So I am 25 years old, as Dr. Martinelli said, and so how did I ascend to be a public affairs manager for a Fortune 100 company at 25 years old? I learned very early in life that the best leaders are even better followers, right? And so what does that mean, Eric? It means that you are a sponge. You are able to listen, you are able to learn, and you are able to support the visions of others because once you become a leader in your own respect, you're going to want folks who are, who are supporting you to be able to listen, to be able to learn, and to support your vision. So you have to learn those attributes while you, um, as you continue to grow and as you continue to evolve and develop along the way. So keep that in mind. So here we go. I attended Florida a and University, one of, I, I believe, one of the best institutions on the planet. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong, WV was great, but I had an awesome experience at Florida a and University. I learned so much not only about myself, but about just my overall background and my culture as well there. Um, and I had different opportunities to do different things, such as be a part of the Public Relations Student Society of America. Um, I entered um, FAMU in my freshman year asking um, upperclassmen as well as my professors what do I need to do to be successful in this industry? Um, and the, the reoccurring theme was be a part of Prodigy, which was our agency, our student-run agency, as well as be a part of the Public Relations Student Society of America. Professors also told me one more thing was you also have to practice in your writing from, one, from the moment you step on this campus to the moment you leave and then continue to move forward in doing that after you leave. So PRSSA, Prodigy, the student-run firm, as well as working on my writing. Those were the three, the three tips that I literally latched on to and worked on my whole time while I was um, at FAMU. So we talked about, you know, well, I opened up by saying the best leaders are even better followers, right? And so when I got into PRSSA, I was not automatically a leader. I was a member. And then after that first year of membership, I then raised my hand and said, hey, I actually want to be the vice president. And as the vice president, 
I um, it was it was more so because nobody wanted to raise their hand and do it. Nobody wanted the responsibility of leadership, right? Nobody wanted to do the hard work. Nobody wanted to stay up all night doing name badges for conferences. Nobody wanted to do the work of putting together fundraisers, getting up early to be there for volunteer events. Nobody wanted to do that, right? Because and especially have a title that means you have to do it, right? Um, so I said, you know what? I'll go ahead and be the vice president. But as the vice president. My, my goal and my vision and my goal and my vision was, was more so to support the goal and the vision of the president at the time. And if you're a vice president, chair, committee chair, um, so just you don't have a role, a leadership role in the chapter in, in, um, right now, keep that in mind that your, that you should really do everything you can to support the leadership and the vision of your agency lead or your president of your chapter. Um, and that's how I took it. So there were things that my president did I didn't necessarily agree with. I didn't think it was also the right direction, but I trusted her leadership, and I trusted the fact, her, 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 in respect of the fact that she was the president of the chapter. And so we just worked. Whatever she wanted to do, we worked it out. We figured out a way to get it done. We made it happen. And then that, that really took, took the chapter to a different level. Because it wasn't just myself doing it. I had a, we also worked as a team. It was other vice presidents. It was other chapter members who, really, who wanted to be really intentional about the things we wanted to learn as a chapter, the, things we want, the, the speakers we wanted to bring in, and the experiences we wanted to have. Flash forward, the next year, of course, I ran for president, right? And so became the president of the chapter, and now it was my time to have a vision for the chapter. It was my time to say, okay, you all, this is what we want to do. Uh, um, but I also couldn't just like, it, all, it always couldn't be about me, right? I had to really understand and listen to those who I, again, was leading to kind of hear not only what my vision for the chapter was, but also hear from them what they want to see coming to fruition in their experience as well. Um, had an amazing year as chapter president. Um, I then interned at Edelman. I, I was um, that first year as chapter president. And then I, that summer, I had an internship at Edelman in the Atlanta office, working their consumer food group. And then from there, had amazing experience. Um, it was phenomenal. Like, I would recommend going, on, going, on, going to a PR agency for an internship, whether it's the scale of an Edelman, whether it's a mid-sized firm, whether it's a small firm. Agency experience is, is like none other. You really learn and do everything. Um, and that was, and that's, what I, that's the experience I had that summer. Through my cohort, I, I met someone who was familiar with the national committee process or who knew somebody who ran for the national committee. We talked about it, and she was like, Eric, I think you'd actually be a good, a good fit for one of the positions. You should really look into it. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Like, I'm just, quite, like, this element internship, this is it for me. Like, I love it. Um, I'm like, it's only, I just want to, like, ride out the rest of my, my, um, my three, two or three years left at the university and get, come back here and work full time. I, took, I, I thought about it some more, and I was like, well, you know, I read, the, I read the job description for the vice president of the advocacy role, and I was like, well, I can do this. It's, it's just like being a chapter president. You're just scaling up of like doing it for 300, 350 plus chapters across the U.S. and across, and I think one in Europe, Puerto Rico, no. South America, that's the other one, three in South America. Um, and so I, I just threw my name in the hat, and I was like, well, it's, it doesn't be, it doesn't, it's, um, doesn't be, um, it's not hurt to try. So I just went ahead and threw my name in the hat and see what was going to happen. Um, went to Charleston, South Carolina to um, run for the, run for the um, position, right? And there were other folks who were running for national committee. And I, who's all been to a national event before? Okay, right. So who's all been to the assembly before? Okay. So sometimes, just for those who have not, I, I definitely encourage you to go. It's an amazing experience. You get to network and meet with your peers who are in school like you all. I and mean, when you all move and graduate to the profession, you will definitely see them again. There are plenty of folks who I've met while I was a student and met at national events that I see dated by different, by different points um, in my career. <laughs> but I said to say, at assembly, it's kind of like this survival of the fittest type of atmosphere where everybody's trying to get to know you, but they're just trying to get to know you so they can get your vote. They want you to vote them in to be a national officer because it's, it's really cool. It looks really amazing. It's on your resume to be a national officer. Um, but when the work comes, it's then something totally different because you're actually the hardest working PR student in the country. Um, but my approach was I really want to get to know who the members are of the organization. This is, my, this is actually my first time going to a national event. I want to know the people who I will potentially be, end up serving. And so for the first, I want to say, day and a half, nobody even knew I was running. Like, I, I did not introduce myself as like, Eric, hey, I'm Eric Wingfield, I'm running for Vice President of National. No, I didn't do that. I was like, hello, my name is Eric Wingfield. I attend Florida Anime University. This is my first time attending this event. This is your first time. And we had those type of conversations, right? It wasn't until like a day and a half of doing that when folks um, kind of put the name to the application or the, the ballot. Oh, you're that year. I was like, yeah, I really didn't want to 
say I was running for committee because I wanted to know who you are as a person, but yes, I am running. If I can get your support, amazing, great, do that. Um, and I don't know, so the, the South Carolina run, everybody went up, and of course the Vice President of Advocacy is one of the last races to run, to, um, to get up and speak, do your, do your panel questions and everything. And students, that was literally by far known in history as the longest uh, election because um, literally, I was up, we were up there for like 45 minutes answering Q&A about what our thoughts were for the position. Long story short, I got the role and then the real work began, right? Um, that next summer, I ended up interning at NBC Universal, another great experience working in-house for a really big media mogul. Um, and it was just phenomenal. And then came back to the to Florida a University. I knew that I was going to finish. I knew that because of the exposure I got from the National Committee, the, the, the work that, the type of work that we did, the people who I networked with, networking is important, we'll talk about that in our presentation, um, that I will have the, I will have the, I will, I will land somewhere and definitely, most likely I wanted to go back to Edelman where I was, um, I had interned. And so, I, that was on my mind, but also a, a huge desire I had was to complete my master's degree and go to grad school. And interestingly enough, uh, as fate would have it, I um, attended the DC um, PR SSA Icon event, and I met Nicole Beeson, who's sitting right there in the back. Um, and we were just having a great time, and like we had spent the whole day like networking and being recruiting and talking to people. And so we were both. So Nicole was tired from the WVU IMC recruiting, and I was just tired, like, because you know we were. I was a national committee member, so we had to be on, right? We had to meet everybody. We had to smile, and we just wanted to, like relax and decompress. We had some, Nicole and I had a conversation, again, an authentic, authentic conversation just about what I was interested in doing, what she did, and how she get her role. She asked me about some of the things I wanted to do, and I said, I really have this burning desire to go to grad school, but I just don't know how to work it out right now because folks, uh, my mentors keep telling me, go to grad, go get experience first, then go to grad school. And other mentors said, just go ahead and get out of the way. You can make it work with your experience. So I was kind of like in a catch-22, right? I went ahead and under, um, somebody told me this, my, one mentor told me this one piece of advice that I'll always take it with me. Your journey is just that, your journey. And that is true for your leadership journey is that. So you have to appreciate your journey, where you are in your journey, as well as the steps you're taking in your journey. And understand that just one decision you make is not an end all be all. You can always pivot from that decision and, and then move to do, to do something else. I was still young. I was really, I was in my early 20s at the time, 20, 19, 20 years old. So a lot of times at that age, we put the world on our shoulders, right? It'd be like, we have to have the perfect internship. We have to have the perfect job. We have to have the perfect grades because we want to have the perfect career when in our actuality, perfect doesn't exist. Perfect is whatever you make it. I'm really happy and comfortable with what I do right now because I let, it, I let go of other perceptions of what perfect was and I made perfect what I wanted it to be. And so from there, I, just, I made a decision to go to, to come to grad school. I, I came to the best IMC program in the country, WVU. And I was also, it, it worked out because the program hired me as a graduate assistant. So I had a job getting experience in my field and I was also getting my master's degree. So it's amazing how when you put things out there, the things you want to happen and you, and you just believe it, it kind of comes to you. So I, I spent a year and a half here in Morgantown, West Virginia in this very room. Um, off my, on my cubicle is actually around the corner if you want to see it. Um, in this very room and learned and listened. And again, I was this big national officer. I had all this esteem. Like people knew who I was. I'm now a graduate, I'm now a graduate assistant, the lowest thing <laughs> on the totem pole in a university setting, right? Um, and again, I had to remember that the best leaders are even better followers. And so although I was, I was very blessed to have a lot of autonomy and, and be able to recommend things and suggest, and suggest um, strategies and suggest ways of doing things, I had to remember at the end of the day, I'm not the leader. But if I want to be the leader, I have to support the leader's vision. So my director is actually in the back, Chad uh, Mesra, he's in the back right there. And there are plenty of times that there will be, like Chad will be in a meeting and Nicole will be in a meeting and they actually invited me to the meeting sometimes. And I was like, I disagree. And Chad was like, that's great but we're gonna do it this way anyway. And I was like, you know what? Okay, because you are the boss, right? And no matter, no matter if, I, if I agree with the strategy or I didn't, I still ran my hardest because at the end of the day, the best leaders are even better followers. And, and that experience and, and, and just that, and my work at, my, like people seeing my work ethic, it opened up doors, right? And so when it was time to leave the program, I had all these people in my corners wanted to make sure that I had the best opportunity I possibly could. I had Chad, I had Nicole, I had the IMC 
um, professional faculty. I had Dr. Martinelli, I had Dean Reed of the Reed College. I had my own network from PRSA, PRSSA. I had my friends who I met at national events. I just had all these people, my, my Florida a &M alumni, all these people work with me to help identify what is the perfect opportunity for Eric Winkfield. And understand how I said the perfect opportunity for Eric Winkfield. Because um, sometimes there are opportunities out there that are not really for us. And we have to remember that what, 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 is it, what does perfect look like for us, right? And so there was, a, there was somebody who I met. Her name was Clarissa Bayer Taylor. Um, I met her my sophomore year undergrad. Um, I was actually going to be working. I actually um, was, she was one of the options. So she was a vice president of GE Transportation. And GE is really known for their management leadership development program. And before I graduated undergrad, it was the GE program, Edelman, or coming to WVU. I knew I really wanted to go to WVU. But both of those looked really amazing, right? But my heart told me WVU was the, off, was, was the option. And so I remember emailing Clarissa saying, you know what, Clarissa, thank you so much for getting me this opportunity to be in this GE um, leadership development program. However, I have this amazing opportunity at West Virginia University to get my master's degree for practically free and also work full time. Um, and Clarissa re reached back out to me, because again, we had been in communication since my sophomore year. And so when you meet people along the way, keep in touch with them. So with her, I would check in with her maybe quarterly, semesterly. Um, I just had my own little cadence with her, and she just remembered my name, and, and we had a familiarity about ourselves. And when I reached out to her and I told her my dilemma, what I believe was a dilemma, because a lot of times we believe things are dilemmas and they're not really dilemmas. Um, <laughs> She was like, I totally understand that. Go get your master's degree. You are a young minority uh, male of color. Uh, you're, you're a young man of color in this industry. Um, go get your degree, right? And so she was like, GE will be here when you're done. So I went ahead. I said, thank you so much. I came here. So then flash forward to my last semester here um, as an as a IMC master's student. I reached back out to Clarissa. I actually, I actually reached out to her to, to come and speak at an event that we were having here, um, we were having in Chicago, actually. We were having in Chicago, and then I also asked her, you know, hey, if, you, if that GE offer is still there, I'm ready, <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> um, and she was like, give me some time, I'll let you know something. And I was like, okay. Two months went by, I was like, time is gone, I'm here. <laughs> Get ready to graduate in like a month, like what's going on? Um, and she said, actually, Eric, I'm leaving GE, I'm going to Exelon, working on the PHI business, which is in DC. Um, I had a great time at GE. I spent 15 years there. I'm, trying, I'm, I'm, right, I'm ready to do something else. So my response to her, congratulations, go for it, amazing. However, if you're looking to build a new team, you need somebody with a, a, some junior level experience, you just need to do some, some things, here's your guy. And she was like, actually, I do. She was like, what do you want to do? I was like, well, you know, I really want to start out doing media relations. Um, I, but I don't want to just limit myself there. I also want to do some internal comms and do a little Marcom. I have this real good IMC degree. I can do all this type of things with it. I want to try out some video, like video producing, things like that. Literally a week later, she sent me a link with everything that I've said I wanted to do in that link. Uh, and I applied to it. Applied to that job. And originally the job was going to be in Salisbury, Maryland. Who knows what Salisbury, Maryland is? Okay, you guys are much better than I am because I had no idea where Salisbury, Maryland. I couldn't even, I was, what would I call it, Salisbury, um, when I first got the, um, the offer. And so, wait, are you all from Eastern Shore? Hey! Not Eastern Shore? Maryland, okay, great. Um, I had no idea what Salisbury, Maryland was. I was like, what, where is this, right? Again, kid from Miami, Miami, Florida, originally from right here, right? And so I was like, okay, great. She, I was like, that, that's the opportunity I want, that's what I want to do, I'll go travel to Salisbury, Maryland. Sometimes the opportunity you want, and sometimes the, the, um, the leap you need in your career is in a place where you never thought or never think you would ever go. Never would have known I would have been in Morgantown, West Virginia. And when I was telling my family, my friends who are all from Florida, that I was moving to West Virginia, they're like, oh yeah, Virginia, right? So, you, so we, anytime we go to Norfolk, like whatever, we can go with me. I was like, no, it's West Virginia, a totally different state, um, but I'll be there for some, for some time. But, I said, you know what, I'm going to take the job. Wherever you want to put me, I'll put it. And then, then had, as, as, um, as chance have it, she ended up having to move, relocate that role to the nation's capital. And so then I had my first job out of grad school, and undergrad, rather, at Pepco Holdings as a communication specialist. 
um, doing doing very much mature work for somebody at that at that level. And I didn't gripe about doing more than what I was getting paid to do. I was like, I'll do it because I want the experience. And in, within a year's time, she actually left the organization to go to another to go, to go take another another global opportunity somewhere else. But the presidents and executives who I was supporting, and they saw my work ethic and saw how hard I was running, and saw that I didn't, even though I had really good ideas, I was able to still listen to theirs and just activate what they wanted to do, despite what I felt was right or wrong. Um, they honored that, and they then brought me on to the governmental and external affairs team. And that's why I received a, promo a promotion with the corporation after a year as a public affairs manager. So what do I do now? I manage public affairs and, out and community outreach campaigns. There are so energy is a, it's a really exciting time right now in the energy space. Um, the whole business is changing. The way that we look at energy is changing. Um, at one point, regulators and private corporations were like this. Now they're like this, trying to figure out what's the best way to create um, sustainable solutions for our country, right? And the only way you can do that and really transform how we look at energy and how we look at renewables is if you have subject matter experts as well as the regulators working together to figure out solutions. And so a lot of what I do is build advocacy and public awareness campaigns. And what do I have to do? I have to work with our consultants, who are our PR folks, um, who are lobbyists. And I have to sit them all at the table. And we have to talk about strategy. Got, I got all my, strat my strategy sense by just listening, being here in the IMC program, and getting a master's degree. Um, I got the activation piece by just being a doer while I was a student. I'm still, I'm, and I'm no, don't get me wrong, I'm still a doer, because I'm still very young in my career. But I got comfortable being a doer and understanding the, the, um, the, the uh, underlying strategies of what it is to be a doer. So when I do have to make those strategic decisions, I understand what it takes to activate those, those tactics, right? And so that's my story. And I'm here today talking to you all. I, I was honored. And that's another, one, more, one more point, and I'll turn it back over to you, Doc. I have the ability to be honored as the emerging leader of the year by the Planck Center. Thank you. How did I get that award? Um, through, through that whole story, I always kept in mind that it's not always about me. There's somebody looking at me saying that, because you can do it, I can do it too. Matter of fact, my mentee came up and said that. She said, because, uh, because you, what did she say? Because you are, um, I am. Something like that. She said it much better than I. She actually had me in tears that night. Um, but <laughs> I say that to say is that through my whole entire experience, through, through like going to Edelman, through going to NBC Universal, through National Committee, to being president, to working here at the IMC program, any opportunity I had to sit down and either speak with somebody one-on-one -on -one who wanted to do something similar, any opportunity I had to share something I've learned along the way, something I messed up on or something I really failed at, I shared that with them because a lot of times it's not always the success that really helps folks. Sometimes it's our failures as well. Um, and we can't, we, we can't be so prideful in showing folks how well we are. We all, we all have to kind of be a little vulnerable and authentic and show folks where we're, where we're a little weak at and where we really messed up at. Um, any opportunity I had to share my story and share, and share some of the things I've learned along the way, I took it. And there are people talking behind me, behind my back, and saying, well, you know, there's this kid from Miami, Florida, who went to Florida a University who finished his IMC degree at West Virginia University. And there's something about him that we want to put him up for that award. Dr. Martinelli is one of those people. Chad Mesler back there actually wrote my recommendation letter. I didn't even know it. Um, another mentor of mine, Alicia Thompson, who was a vice president at Edelman while I was there, we kept in touch. And, we checked, and I checked in with her and let her know what was going on. Keith Burton, who I met for the very first time in Boston when, when the PR SSA conference was at Boston, said, there's something about you, kid. <laughs> and I want to be a part of your, your journey. And I was like, I'm young. I don't know anybody. Sure, anybody I can support me, yes, let's do it. These are my goals. How do I get there? Give me your insight. Let's do it. Um, and I was at work, really frustrated. Like, it was, it was really bad. It was, a really, it was a project that was going horribly wrong. And I get this random call from Chicago. So our company's headquarters in Chicago. And so, excuse my language, I'm like, oh, shit, what did I do that have headquarters calling me? <laughs> Um, literally, because like, I'm always in trouble. Chad and Nicole will tell you I'm always in trouble, right? Um, and like the fact that headquarters is calling me from an unknown number, I'm like, oh, man, I really must have messed up. I'm getting ready to be fired. It was Keith Burton, that, that guy who I met in, in Boston. And he was like, Eric, I want to let you know something. 
the Planck Center. Um, I, he was like, you know what the Planck Center is? I said, of course I know what the, what the Planck Center is. Of course I know who, who Bessie Planck is. Um, we have this thing called the Milestones and Mentoring Gala every fall, and we honor various leaders about different topics, and um, we have this category called the Emerging Leader Award. And we actually, we act, you are one of the front runners for this award. And I'm like, wow, wasn't expecting that, but cool. And he's like, I'm taking a step further. You, you actually like more than just the front runner for the award. We, we voted to go ahead and give you the award. And I was like, wow. And so when I was reading the award and reading that it was, it was simply about mentoring and helping others and, and also doing reverse mentorship, um, also mentoring folks who are older than you in the career, but more so being able to give back, not feeling like you're, because you're never too young to mentor somebody or show somebody something that you learned. They were like, we, we recognize that, we want to honor you. And so I was again elevated to another national platform. And then again, working at Pepco, excited to do what I do every day and really excited to be here with you all. Thank you. So what I invite you, each of you, to think about a leader whom you admire. So it could be a peer, it could be you know, a teacher, a, a politician, uh, anyone, someone that, who you admire as a leader, okay? And write down at least three and up to five characteristics of that person that you think makes them such a great leader. So keep that in mind, one leader whom you admire, three to five characteristics of that person. You're all writing about Eric, right? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Do you have your list? Still working on it? Why again, you? Remember to always, like, while you're in the session, take notes and take nuggets back to your chapters, right? Again, share, take, these, take these learnings back so you can continue to grow and foster leaders where you are. Once you've got your list, turn to somebody next to you and share your list with theirs. Okay, and I, I want to hear uh, if we have any commonalities. Okay, so you guys share your list together. Okay, did you guys have any, any similarities in your list in terms of 
the characteristics you identified? Did you? So what, what were some of those similarities? What were some of the characteristics that you guys had in common when you compared notes? Empathy. Empathy. Mm -hmm. Excellent, yeah. Passion, Passion for, for others. others. Good one. Anything else? Yes. Yes, ma'am. That's an excellent point. Yeah, to be a leader doesn't mean you have to be the formal leader, right? Leadership can come from anywhere right. in the team. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. What were some of the other characteristics? We have empathy, right? Yeah, in the back. Communication, Communication. great. So yeah. important. Yes, sir, you had your hand up? Trustworthy. It's a good one. Yeah, yeah. We're going to see some of these same characteristics again as we move through uh, the program. So as I mentioned before, research demonstrates that leadership really begins at a very early age, and team leadership is usually the first foray into leadership for uh, young people and for leaders in general. And it doesn't matter what size team you're leading. It doesn't matter kind of what kind of team it is. It doesn't matter where in life leadership principles hold across all of these kinds of situations. Great work teams, of course, have great leaders. How many of you have been on a, on a work team? Maybe it's a classroom team. Maybe it's a PRSSA committee that didn't go so well. Why? What were some of the reasons you think it didn't go well? Yes. Poor communication. Okay. That's so a good one. Great leaders are first grade followers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Even better but followers. Leadership can come from anywhere in the team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that can be a problem. Too many people trying to, to take control. Okay. What else? Lack of compromise. Lack of compromise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lack of saying this is our common goal and objective, right? And it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not your way is right or my way right. It's like it's about the work. That's what needs to be first and center, right? Not who it is, not whose agenda, whose idea, right? It's all together. And the more brains you have working on something, the better it is. You know, I had a student once, excellent student, and um, she was the head of her, of her capstone class, her campaign team. She was the team lead, right? She was the account supervisor. And at the end of the semester, I thought, oh, my gosh, this is going to be an awesome team. This is going to be, they're going to do such great work. At the end of the semester, I got the feedback from the other team members to evaluate each other. They couldn't stand her leadership, right? I was stunned. I had not done something that's important for leaders to do, and that is to check in periodically to see how things are going. You know, to test the waters at different point in time to make sure everything was going well. She was very bright. She went on. She worked at an agency. But it was a really humbling experience for her because why? She wanted to do it her way. She knew she was smart. She knew she was capable. She said, okay, so this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it. Well, what about this idea? No, this is what we're going to do, right? That's not a collaborative leader. That's not getting the benefit of the group, right? That's not putting the work first. It's putting the ego first. And so often, even if you are the formal leader, you have to step back and first talk to your team. Collaboration, that's a point that we'll get to a little bit later. And as Eric said, great leaders help develop others. Are you guys now as leaders in your chapter starting to uh, develop relationships with younger people in your chapter to bring them forward? You know, I have seen PRSSA chapters flourish <laughs> one year and the next year flounder. Yeah. Why? Because they were all upperclassmen. They didn't take the time to reach out or to go to a professor and say, hey, do you know any really freshmen who are excited about PR who we might get? So I can personally go and invite them, bring them in, because you know what it's like when you're a freshman. You're intimidated, right? You're intimidated to walk into that, into that uh, meeting, right? But as a leader, it's beyond you. It's, again, it's about the bigger picture is the organization. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than you. How do you sustain the organization? And so here we want to talk about strength-based leadership, right? And so what are strengths? Anyone besides looking at the tour? Of course, strengths are things that your skills, 
the things that you are really strong in, as well as the talent, like you're really talented in a certain aspect of um, leadership. And a strength is an attribute or quality of an, of an individual. And so one thing about strength-based leadership, we, we don't have to be strong in everything, right? But a good leader understands, identifies what their strengths are, what the strengths are of their team, and how do they, how do they make everybody work together in concert so we, everybody's working together and building, building weaknesses into strengths, as well as leveraging what other people are more smarter at in those different attributes. And Finding your strengths. And, and what I'd like you to do now is really to, again, stop and reflect for a moment. Mm -hmm. What are your strengths? Yeah. I want you to write down three of your strengths that you have, you think that you bring as a leader. Three strengths that you bring to the table. Mm When you've got your strengths, I want you to turn to somebody you know, and I want you to ask them, what do you think my strengths are? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you might want to get in groups too, maybe like, you don't have to get out or anything. <laughs> So let me ask you, were, were they aligned or were they different? Some, but some different, some, some different. alignment and some different. See, you have more strengths than you think you do, right? Other people see things in you you may not even see in yourself. And that's another important part of mentorship and feedback. You know, as humans, we tend to be very self-critical, yeah. right? We tend to see the flaws and the weaknesses, and that feeds our insecurity. Right? That feeds, I can't, be a, I can't be an officer. I don't know anything about it. I just, mm -hmm. right? Negative self-talk. Don't do that to yourself. See your strengths. We all have strengths. I told you earlier, we started being leaders back when we were in kindergarten and grade yeah. school and middle school. You bring a lot to the table just as, as you are. And you know people you can ask who can, who can help you along the way. Positive self-talk, self-confidence, some of that gravitas. So don't self-sabotage with the negative. Look at your strengths, as Eric said, as part of your team, your chapter, your committee, your work group. Where maybe are you not as strong mm -hmm. and others have that strength that you can tap into them and have them help you along the way. Great. And I will actually recommend that you take a look at um, three of these strength finders um, or these different um, surveys that help you identify what your strengths are. There may be some things that come up in these surveys that you are strong in based on, based on questions they have about your personality that you may find, oh, I didn't, I guess I am that way. Or some things you would think you were strong in, you're like, oh, I guess I'm not as strong. I want to reevaluate that a little bit. Um, and my recommendation is that everyone, you should really start your semester, your year off with doing something like this. Um, it's especially if you're getting ready for a new, a new year. It's a really good way to break the ice and get, to, get kind of level set a little bit and get more of an understanding of where folks are 
And before you start delegating and assigning too much or start making too many committees, you kind of, you, you can really use that to kind of inform what you're going to do. And I will tell you, we do have a handout for you, a packet, which we do. I'll give you in a moment uh, here when we get ready to do the exercise. Yep. Um, but it lists these, it lists the URL. Some of these are free. Some of them cost, um, you know, from 19.99 and on up, depending on how much you want to dig into it. But we will give you that resource that you can check it out later. And so now we're going to go into our guidelines for building constructive and rich teams. So number one, every team needs clarity and structure, right? So you need to know who's doing what. Who, who's, who's, who, who's wheelhouse has, whose wheelhouse owns what project or what assignment, and make sure that it's clearly communicated at the beginning. Yes, things change throughout time, but you want to make sure you have a clear set of what's what in the beginning. Then you want to be sure to um, clearly communicate what your goals are. As leaders, that is our bread and our butter to make sure we set goals and we communicate those goals, right? And we want to make sure that we also clear, um, clarify the individual roles and how those roles affect the achievement of those goals. Um, one thing I will say is, when, you, when you're setting goals, make sure you also set up checkpoints, right? So you can kind of measure yourself and measure your team of where, where you all are in achieving your goals. And if, you know, through those checkpoints, you can kind of decide, okay, is it working? Great, we can leave it as is. If it's not working, where are those opportunities that we can identify to really, really uh, maximize? Do we have to shift some people around? Do we have to just bring a different uh, idea to the table? How do we really coach our, because we're coaches as, as well as leaders, we have, how do we coach our team to really hit those targets? Um, establish norms and pro of conduct and protocol. So what is your way that you want people to report into you? Do you, like, how do you want people to make sure, how do you want people to check in with you to make sure things are happening? How do you want, how, what are the protocols of how, how everything will operate in your chapters and your agencies? You want to make sure that your teams know that and, 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 as soon as possible. Like, so right after you identify your strengths your strength and everything, you want to make sure folks are clear about how everything is run and what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. Um, and set standards. As leaders, as the leaders of our teams, we are the, we are the standards that we hope, that we, that we want our folks to, to follow, right? And so whatever standards you set for your team, be sure, to, yeah, be, be, be sure you can be able to follow that yourself. The worst thing to be in the world is to have all these high expectations for your team members, and then you can't meet those expectations yourself. And it also level sets a little bit as well. And assess and identify strengths, right? We talked about the strengths finders, and so, Somebody may start out really strong in one area and kind of lack a little bit um, as you move on time. But, uh, might be mindful of that. Keep an eye out on that. Watch that. And then make appropriate uh, moves as necessary. Foster collaboration and inclusion. We talked about this. Don't be that know-it-all who's making all the decisions, right? I mean, more brains are better than, than one, any one brain. So make sure that you have set the tone for asking other people's ideas and advice before just coming in and saying, this is the way we're going to do it. <laughs> Creating a climate of trust, we talked about that, being honest. If you don't know, just say, I don't know, but let me find out for you. Don't try to fake it, right? Be honest with people. Be visible and open, obviously, listening. Listening is so important. Being fully present when you listen, that is a skill. That's part of that communication skill that we talked about, the leadership dimension, right? It's not just about being able to verbalize effectively, but listen effectively. Um, this means that, you know, usually, let me, usually when we're in a conversation, important conversation with someone, what are we doing? We're usually thinking, okay, what am I going to say? Okay, yeah, that reminds me. I want to say this. I want to say this. And you're holding that in your mind. I want to, I want to, or you step on someone. You interrupt because you want to get engaged in that conversation. Instead of sitting back, Listening fully, and then when that thought comes in your mind, instead of trying to hold it, hold it so you're not fully focused, because when you're doing that, you're listening, your perception narrows. When we multitask, our perception narrows, right? So then you can't pick up the nonverbals, right? You can't wholly be present to process what that person's saying. So if that happens to you, say, just a minute, hold that, please hold that thought just a minute. I want to write this down, it's relevant but I want to be able to come back and focus wholly on you, right? So listening with your full self, exhibiting positive energy, right? It's all about energy. Mm -hmm. Now, this guy doesn't have any energy, but <laughs> no. I mean, right? All about the energy you bring. 
Yeah, and can I um, interject right here? So you're in, you are you, you have to set the tone for how you want your team to respond and want your team to be, right? So if you're walking in like, oh my gosh, like we can't do this. Or, or, or you're, and you may not be saying it, but your demeanor is just like, I don't know how we're going to get through this thing. You can't be that way. You have to really exude the energy that you want your team to be able to take on because, again, you are the leader. You're the head, and it starts with you. So even if it's impossible to you, you have to come in, oh, okay, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to get it done. Um, figure it out. We're going to have fun doing it as well. But you have to be the one to really exude the energy you essentially want your team to have. Exactly. I, um, years ago, I was at a stress management uh, session, uh, always learning, right, always growing. And um, the presenter said something to me. At the time, I thought, this is utterly ridiculous, right? She was talking about when you're low energy, when you're not feeling that well, and stress makes us do that. Stress gives us low energy. It tends to make us sick, right? It has these deleterious effects on us. She said, you know, you just look yourself in the mirror that day. You wake up, you're dragging. You say, look at I feel good. I feel great. I feel terrific. Mm -hmm. I feel good. I feel great. I feel, right? That positive self-talk. At the time, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is the most ridiculous, right? Yeah. But have I used that technique? Absolutely. I've gotten up, and I didn't feel well. And I thought, I've got this long day, and you know what? I'm not going to self-talk and say, oh, my gosh, I'm so tired. I had a long day. I've got this. i got that. Da, 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 right? I'm going to say, you know what? I got this. I feel good. I took my vitamin C. I had my tea. I'm ready to go. Rock and roll. Right? Yeah. My manager, um, former manager, Nicole, right there in the back, every <laughs> time she, re she, she refers to me, she calls me. Sunshine. sunshine. <laughs> Be the sunshine. Be the sunshine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jasper. I'm Dr. Fessman. Thank you. No, that's fine. Yeah. Um, I wanted to share a story, too. And Dr. Martinelli knows who I'm talking about. Um, for me, Dr. Uh, um, Audrey Lovinger um, is exemplifies everything she's been talking about here. Mm -hmm. Audrey Lovinger was a founding faculty member of the College of Communication at Boston University. Mm -hmm. um, she's 93 years old. She's going every day in this office mm -hmm. doing, doing research to this day. She's the most energetic person that I know. She visited me about five years back in Germany, and I thought it was 89 at that point. So I was like, OK. <laughs> very so I had uh, planned extra time in uh, the, the bed and, and laid out. And of the result was I laid out. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So we think we don't, you know, feel bad, right? Yeah. We got young bodies and young <laughs> energy out there. Hey, thank you. Thank you for thank sharing. Thank you. That. Um, being that role model that Eric talked about, facilitating relationships, right? Again, we're, we're all about relationship building in public relations and also as leaders, about mm -hmm. really honing and develop relationships within your team. And working to limit in-groups or the lone wolves. Mm -hmm people who just don't seem to be part of the circle or, you know, haven't bought into the program. And Eric's going to talk a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess that's the next slide, huh, mm -hmm. Eric? We'll do that later. Let me just mention something quickly on this one, though. I saw I, I left off a point, engaging introverts. Um, you know, a lot of times in teams what happens is it's the people who are the most outgoing whose ideas get thrown out there. And there are always people who are shy, people who are more reserved, people who just process things more fully and thoughtfully before jumping in, right? Mm -hmm. So in public relations in particular, we have a lot of extroverts and people who think and they're throwing out things. Don't forget about the introverts, right? Mm -hmm. Give introverts a chance to process, a chance to think. One of the techniques I like to have if I'm in a group where I know one person <coughs> seems to be more reticent to contribute, is I'll say, okay, let's all think about an idea regarding X, X issue. And I want everybody to write it down. Don't put your name on it. So we think about it, and we, we have people write it down. Put it in a hat, and then just draw out the idea without any name attached. That way you know you're going to include that person who may be a little shyer, who may not be willing to speak up. And also as a leader, it's up to you 
to be able to call and engage that person as well, right? So if you notice that somebody isn't contributing, call on that person. Hey, you know what? I know you've really got some great ideas. You've been sitting back and listening here. What do you think, right? Don't let the extroverts make the decision and forget about the sometimes incredible ideas, right, that the introverts can bring to the table. And there's actually a TED Talk about this, The Power of Introverts. Mm -hmm. And there's actually another TED Talk called um, uh, something about uh, the beauty of extroverts. So we've, we've got both. Uh, often extroverts can be seen not as leadership material, surprisingly enough, because they can be seen as too aggressive, too jumping in, too micromanaging, too happy, right? They can't necessarily be serious. So again, balancing that and being aware being self-aware, and we'll talk about self-awareness, too. Yeah, and so now we're going to talk about strengthening and developing others, which is a really key part of being an being effective leader. It's so we talked about, it's not always about you. And actually, we're going to talk about um, a, a, a concept that I, that I really wholeheartedly believe in called servant leadership later. But as leaders, you understand that as your role as leaders to put your folks, to put the people who you're leading first. And it involves other idea generation and decision making. So you, as a leader, you don't have to make every decision believe it or not. Sometimes you can delegate those decisions out and it actually shows their team that you trust them to think through things and to make the decision to be the right decision. Now, if it's the right decision, great. If it's the wrong decision, you still support your team members anyway, right? And then you make sure you identify the learnings there that could be as well. Um, you mentor and coach. You are being, you're being mindful that you, somebody has to help you get to where you are, right? And you have to be able to do the same thing for, the, for somebody else. People are at different levels in their leadership and professional journeys, and you have to recognize, identify, and appreciate where they are. And a lot of times, you're going to have to coach them to a different level or to the level that you, with the expectations that you have for them. And that takes patience, that takes time, and it also takes consistency as well. Um, from there, I would say, make sure I get the point. Um, what is what's the difference, right? And like, what is different from what you do, what, how you do everything, how do they do anything, and also be mindful of that. Some people do things differently than you do. Is it wrong? Is it right? Different, is, different does not always mean wrong. Different just means a different perspective of approach. Um, enrich team member skills. So try to identify some, some of the gaps um, as far as skill sets that team members have and match them up with projects that you may have or like tasks that you may have on the team that will help build those skill sets. Because again, we're all in, in this thing together to develop and be great professionals, right? And then provide constructive, constructive feedback. So if your feedback is coming from a place of I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm annoyed, or I'm tired, take a moment. Don't talk to them then. <laughs> Wait till the next day and bring it up then. Um, you want to make sure when you're giving constructive feedback, how, how, ask yourself before, when you look at the feedback, how is this going to help this person advance? And then not only how is the feedback going to help this person advance, how is my delivery of the feedback going to help that person advance? Sometimes it needs to be a stern, listen, get it together. But sometimes it needs to be, let's talk about it, let's understand what went right, what went wrong, and let's, let me help you get there. And so you have, as a leader, you have, to, you have to really, we talked about not leading from an emotional place, right? So you have to really check yourself first before you're ready to check one of your team members. Um, and foster accountability, right? So accountability works two ways. It's accountability to the team who you're leading, to you. But more so importantly as leaders, it's your accountability to them. And so at the end of the day, the buck stops with you, right? And so if something doesn't happen and a team member drops the ball, as a leader, you do your part to check in with a team member to make sure they're on task. If they weren't on task, as a leader, what did you do to offer your assistance or bring somebody else along and say, hey, can you help, um, can you help somebody else with this? I know you have your task done. Can you, because you're done early, can you help them get this done? As a team, every, every part, every person in the team is important. Um, and I would just um, add as well that you know, a coach typically is someone who's going to work with you on specific skill sets, mm -hmm. right? You might have a tennis coach. You might have a life coach who asks the right questions of you to get you to maybe think and see things in a different way. A mentor really can be all kinds of things. Exactly. A mentor can be a sounding board. Mm -hmm. It can be someone who's a role model. It can be someone who helps open doors for you. Confidant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, and it can be someone who, sh it should be someone who can be empathetically direct. Mm -hmm. with you, can give you the constructive feedback, can be totally honest with you. And, and can look at the situation mm -hmm. 
that you're describing as something negative and being say, you know what, Eric, you're the wrong, you're wrong in the situation. Um, a lot of times we bring, we have these ideas, we go to our mentors with problems, and we're like, this person is awful, they're doing X, Y, and Z. The mentor's like, wait a minute, where's your ownership in this as well? You want, you want people like that in your corner. Yes. But it can be one of the most important things um, to really get things done. It sure can. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially if you write down, if you promised a month ago that you actually do that and you have a meeting and say, you said six weeks ago or a month ago, you, what did you say? It's very different than confronting people, and it's a, a really useful tool if you really spend the time to use it well. Absolutely, thank you. And we actually have a, uh, a mentorship handout that was developed by the Planck Center. Again, in these handouts we're going to give you here in a, in a few moments. Mm -hmm. And we also have tips for conducting effective meetings. So it's a very quick little checklist for you, and it includes taking those kinds of minutes. And absolutely, thank real you. life example, um, I told you all I help support the, uh, manage the agencies who, who work for us to do different things and help support us in different projects. We make all the agencies, no matter how big, how small, you need to give us an action item list or minutes from our meeting because, you know, when you're managing multiple projects as a client, you want to make sure your agency is on top of it. And so that's the minutes is one way that we look back and say, what did we say in that meeting? Who was delivering what? And that's how we go. And when we don't have it or when we do have it, we, we go back and check against what. And that's how essentially we grade and evaluate the usefulness of our agencies. Yeah. Yep. And so um, here, here's the fun part. Yeah. You must celebrate and recognize your team members. This is a journey that we're all on. And you have to celebrate. You have to celebrate um, small accomplishments, mid-sized accomplishments, big accomplishments. You figure out the accomplishments you want to celebrate. It should be all of them. And you find a way to acknowledge, whether in a group setting or an individual setting, the great work that your team is doing. You also want to provide emotional fuel. We can do this, right? We talked about that, you, that your energy is what fuels your team's success. And so you should be the one, the, the one always motivating. Nobody should out-motivate you and your team. Um, you, always, you also want to personalize recognitions, right? And so make sure, so if there's somebody individually who's doing an outstanding job, or if there's somebody who just really knocked one task out of the park, you want to make sure either you personally do something that either they like or that, that um, was really make it really um, individual, individualized for that, for that person to them so they can really, one, say that you really value their contribution. And then you, all, every leader, the best leaders always smile and say thank you. My president, she's the president um, of the Government Affairs Unit for PEPCO. And no matter how small the task, no matter how small the ask, she always sends an email says, thank you very much. Thank you. She acknowledges that you took the time out um, to do something in your job description, outside of your job description, whatever. The fact she asked you to do it, and you did it, and did it, did it timely, she says, thank you very much. Now, if it wasn't so good, she had to wait. She, she has a reply as well, but I won't share that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, act spontaneously, right? And so get out of the norm of just like coming in, doing what everybody else says. Like, so me personally, I'm a little, I'm a little radical, right? So um, I would do things like play random songs or like we're going to dance around the office. And my team's looking at me like, who's this guy? Like, where'd you get him from? But it's just be spontaneous. And it's spont um, spontaneity is way too, I said the word wrong, but the way, it's, it's a really a way that you kind of keep your team engaged and keep everybody saying, you know what, my leader cares about me. He cares about my success, not only my success, uh, what I'm doing day to day, but also how I'm doing mentally, right? And so sometimes we're doing something spontane a, spont a, spont a spontaneous act of kindness to your team. It one shows them that you do care about them and you recognize even the little things that they do to support them. And I get silly. To, I tried to get Eric to uh, play the song that he plays for his team, but he's, uh, <laughs> he wasn't going to do that tonight. So. <laughs> she wanted me to play the wobble, and I was like, Doc, I don't know if the wobble is an appropriate message for the conference right. today. Yeah, you can tell I don't know what that song <laughs> is. <laughs> okay, and so next. Get silly now, right? Yep, and so now we're going to talk about the impacts of managing out group members. And so what this is, is those people who are disengaged from your, from your group. The ones who either, like, they don't want to do anything. Um, they're not really contributing much to the team. Um, how do you deal with those, those folks? Tell me some, 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 some of the ways you deal with those individuals right now. Yes, ma'am. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Talking to the group. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Giving them a manageable task that you know they can accomplish, they can take on bigger roles. Amazing. Another great point. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. terrific and you know often again we tend to think if someone's short with us or if they're disconnected that it's about us yeah. we take it personally mm -hmm. you know what did I do why are they acting like that they're, it's not about us right it's usually about them so there's something going on with them as you said maybe it's a lack of confidence maybe it's a personal issue maybe somebody's sick at home mm -hmm. you know maybe they feel as if they they are not they're not valued so don't assume it's you assume, right, that reach out. It's mm -hmm. about the other person first, yeah. not about you. And as leaders, you want to keep an open mind at all times, as much, as much as possible, right? Because, you know, sometimes it's like it's just easier said than done, right? But you want as much as possible to keep an open mind um, about the situations of the individuals who you're leading. And so some of the effects and the impacts of group members like these is that it can really damage the climate and the culture of your group. Like, their, their demeanor and their disposition of what's going on can really take, like, really bring others along with them. They typically, typically try to click up a little bit and say, well, have you recognized X, Y, and Z? That's not working. It's, it's, not, it's ridiculous. And then you next, now you have, it's being a little infectious, right, to your team. Um, it can neg negatively impact the energy and the synergy. Folks who are working well together are now not working so well together because, because of these individuals. And it also reduce the respect they, des um, the respect, reduce the respect they deserve um, in the overall organization. And so, like my clicker is not working. Like, okay. <laughs> um, so here are some strategies that we have to um, that we really wanted to talk and share with you all. Number one is listen. Right. Um, as leaders, you are as communicators. Right. One of our key things as communicators is the ability to listen. You always foster and work on the skill of listening and actively listening as well. And Dr. Martinelli and I talked about this. Is when you listen, don't listen to react or to respond to what they're telling you. Take a step back. Take a moment to really process what it is that they're telling you. And hear some, and you probably can hear the solution if you listen hard enough. Um, show empathy. If it's, if it's a personal matter, a family issue, we are all human, right? And so remember that, that you, have, um, you do have goals, you do have metrics, you do have things you want to achieve, but at the end of the day, we're all human. And if somebody's not doing, doing well as a human being, you have to be able to take a step and just take a step back and really help them. Um, whether it is, okay, I understand you're going through this right now. Let me pull in somebody else to kind of help aid you get that done, move that across the finish line. Um, and help them feel included. And so a lot of times they, they have an attitude or something's wrong and they know, and some, a lot of times they may be guilty of their own selves um, of the lack of performance they're bringing to the team. And so let them know that, okay, that this past is the past, but how do we move forward? And how do we get you back into the fold, right? And then to help facilitate that, because maybe as a leader, you might have to be the one to help facilitate that inclusion back into the fold. And then call on, call on them for feedback, right? Dr. Martinelli always says, you know, like, try to watch your body language, their body language in groups, and see who's disengaged, see who's engaged. A lot of times they're disengaged because you have a lot of type A personalities around the room, and they really can't get a word in. So they was like, well, I can't get a word in anyway, so... Let me just sit back. You might, you might have to be the leader say, you know, wait a minute, she has something to say, let me hear what she has to say. To be able to level set what people are doing or what the room, what's happening in the room. And I would add to that, mm -hmm. um, reinforce the fact that they're speaking up, even if it's an unpopular uh, <coughs> position, right? Mm -hmm. I, I know, um, you know, in, in faculty meetings, right, we, we have a, a faculty member who often is the one who will, who will speak up and, and be the naysayer mm -hmm. of an idea, right? And at one time, this person came to me and said, you know, I feel terrible because I'm always one speaking. I'm just going to quit speaking. No, right? So when this person speaks up, it's like, thank you so much. Thank you for bringing that perspective to the table. It may not be the perspective, right, that we end up going with, but we need to have all of the perspective. We need to think about this holistically, right? So what you have to contribute is really valuable. Thank you for doing that. And you might even see them afterward, too, right? Those people who tend to be the ones who step on others or maybe... Uh, or the type A's who jump in first, right? Because you have an idea and, oh, I know, I'll solve the problem, 
right? You may have to have a talk with them as a leader and say, hey, you, you know, you're fantastic. You're always energetic. You always have an idea, but how about if you just sit back first, right? Because I don't want the younger, fresh, I don't want people to be intimidated. I don't want you to solve all the problems. And as the leader, it's not up to you to solve all the problems. You've got a whole team, right? So use that team. Listen to them before jumping in. Give them a voice. So servant leadership, here we go. So I, I introduced this topic earlier when we began, and servant leadership is just that, like understanding the fact that as a leader, you are serving those who are following you first. So their needs come before yours. <laughs> Um, their, 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 their well-being sometimes come before yours. And if you're a good leader, you balance that well, right? And so it's between the blending balance between leader and servant. Servant first, you focus on the needs of others, especially when the members, especially the team members, before you consider your own. Um, and then this type of leadership can come from anywhere on the team. So we talked about how sometimes it can be too many cooks in the kitchen, right? Too many chiefs, no, no Indians, right? And so how do you level set? Do, do, uh, even though you have a strong opinion, you may feel it's right, can you take a step back? Is it like, can you like lose this battle to win the war, right? And so do you, all, do you always have to be right? There are, more than, there are more than one way to get there. And how do you identify um, that to your team members? You don't lose leadership credibility in this role. Actually, people respect you more when you, when you identify and show that you actually care about them and their success more than your own, right? You have people who will be, end up wanting want to work harder for you, um, do more for you if you, if you position and posture yourself this way. It also leads to higher engagement, and again, they trust you even when your decision as a leader isn't the most popular decision. They're like, well, because I know you're not going to lead us astray and I know you trust us as your team, we can go ahead and do whatever it is that you want to do. Um, leads, and it also really fosters this sense of innovation, right? We always want to be sure that um, we're getting the best ideas from diverse voices and diverse perspectives. We all grew up differently. We all had different life experiences. We all had different career experiences. Your internship was different from my internship. Your time with your, your, your take on the material in PR class is different from my take on the material from PR class. How can you bring all that into one big pot and leverage that so we can have a very innovative and creative way of how we tackle this problem that nobody has possibly even thought of before. Um, and knowledge others' perspectives, even when you do not agree with them. Try to listen, again, listen to understand their perspectives before you listen to react to what you believe may be not the right or wrong way to go about it. Um, provide other support and meet their work and personal goals, right? So how do you do that? You have to have conversations with those you're leading and understand what is important to them. What makes them tick? Where do they want to go? Do you, know, do you know what your team wants to do professionally after they graduate? Have you trying to figure out how you level set that or against like what you're actually assigning them to do on your teams? Think, think about those type of things. And help each other succeed. We are all students. Um, I'm not, I'm sorry. You're all students, praise the Lord. <laughs> oh, we're all students. <laughs> we're all students and we need to help each other succeed. Involve them in the decisions where appropriate. So I talked about not every decision has to be your own, right? Some things you can delegate and say, you know what, whatever you, should, whatever you decide, I'm good with it. Go for it. That, sh that really shows you trust them, and that shows that they, can, they, they have opportunity to then get a sense of what this leadership thing really looks like. Um, and build a sense of community within your team. The best teams are the teams that can laugh, have fun. They're, they're, they're working. It doesn't feel like they're even working at all because they're just having a great time, right? Yes, it's not always going to be songs, roses. <laughs> I'm about to say the sun's not always going to be shining in your team. But when you have a community and you have folks who are on the equal page and who, who one understands and respects where you all want to go, that's what's going to shine through and get you all through those tough times as a team. Somebody's going to drop the ball. Somebody's going to let the team down. But as a leader, you have to give them the grace that you would want if, some, if you were to let your team down. And you also have to coach those who are also on your team to be able to do the same thing. Because at the end of the day, we're all students. We're all waiting to grow. We're all trying to be the best version of ourselves. And we have to give each other the space to be that. Oh, excuse me. And so, oh, there you go. We are playing dueling both. <laughs> um, this type of leadership requires the serious less level of humility, right? And so a lot of times, it's just, again, for the better, what's, what's best for our teams. How humble are you? Are you a humble person? Do your team feels like you're a humble person, right? And if they do not, you have to really do that self-reflection. We'll talk about how to self-reflect a little later about how do I get there? It doesn't happen overnight, but how do I really work on this on humility for the sake of being a better leader? Um, value diverse opinions, right? 
All, don't be so quick to gather yourself or bring people on your team who all think alike. The best teams have people who think very differently and then figure out how to make it all work. Now, it's, not always, it's not always easy to bring people with different opinions together to work together, but if you, work, if you, if you, if you bring the right mix and you foster that, that collaboration, it really, really will work in your favor. And you keep the objective in mind. Again, not exactly. About you, not about it's about our about team. It's about the work. It's about the goal. It's about mm -hmm. the organization. As leaders, you're thinking about it's, it's, it's not you. It's, it's always about your team. So you, the team, and not me, the leader. And so there's a poem that I learned when I, um, when I, was, um, in a, when I was here on campus in my fraternity. It was called I, My, Me, Mine. These are words that do not rhyme. Us, we, ours, together. These are words that last forever. And what essentially what that taught her was that you, no individual brother is more important than the next person. And when we understood that it was us, we, ours, together, that was the best way we were going to have the most success in our fraternity, that's when we succeeded. And the same thing is applicable to life and to your teams. And that's how you really set yourself apart as a leader and go far beyond what um, others expect of you is when you realize that even no matter what role you have, whether it's a president, vice president, team member, um, agency lead, account executive, account whatever your role is, is, it's not I, me, mine, mine, these are words that do not rhyme, us, we, ours together, these are words that last forever. And this was also going to sustain you as an as a, um, amazing leader. Cultivate a culture of trust. So we, there's different things that we talked about today that really helps touch that. How do you get folks to trust you? And also develop other leaders, right? So we talked about after you all graduate, who's going to lead the chapter when you leave? Who's going to lead the agency when you leave? So you want to do these type of things so you can cultivate other leaders and help build leadership skills with other folks. This is why I'm asking you all to write and take down as much notes as possible, because you need to share this information with your, with your teams, with your chapters, with your agencies. Because again, it's not, it's, it, it means nothing if you all learn and, do not, and not take it out and teach somebody else. Um, sensitive to people and their life issues, right? And so again, it's that, it's that humanity piece. We all go through things. Life happens to all of us. And giving people the space to heal and be able to move forward and to grow from their life instance. And you are the best encourager to your team. Nobody out encourages, nobody out encourages you, nobody out motivates you. You are the best person. And you will find that when you do this, your team will, will follow you better, will serve you better, and you all will make the, the, the uh, overall objective much quicker, much happier, and much stronger. So we talked about team leadership, we talked about servant leadership. Now I'm going to give you a handout, and I want you to, um, this, this is your packet of handouts, by the way, and we want you to turn to, okay, thank you, you guys are helping, oh. excellent, there you go. Right. Sure you have well, you talk, I'll take, I'll take care okay. of it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we want you to go to a handout that looks like this. Okay, I think it might be the third one uh, in your packet. Here you go. Thank you. Here you go. Yes, thank you. No problem. That's it. That's it. Yep. This is what it looks like. Leadership values. Okay. Thank you, Jasper. Okay. And so once you get that, you see the, the question here. Blank is a cornerstone in my approach to leadership. These are all values, right? Personal values. Did you see the leadership, the leadership handout? Um, it's right there. You've got it. Leadership values. Yep. So we want you to circle five values of your leadership style, right? Blank is a cornerstone in my approach to leadership. These are all leadership values listed on here. So go ahead and circle at least three up to five leadership values. Did you see? It's, I think it's the third one. Leadership values, it's titled with a blue. Um, right there. You've got it. Right there. Yep. That's it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. For
And up to five leadership values. You have yours on there? Awesome. So good. Oh, you got them already? You guys are great. I love it. All right. So now I want you to take two of those leadership values, and I want you to list a behavior that demonstrates that value. So how do you walk the talk of your value, right? How do you walk the, what's a behavior that illustrates, demonstrates that leadership value? And we're here to see what you all come up with too. So by all means, feel free to share, write it down. Yeah. yeah. What does that look like? You have your your behaviors, okay? All right, let's hear some of them. What do you What do you have? What are some of your examples? What are some of your values? And then, how did you demonstrate that? Yes. I can start with flexibility. When I just recently, since you mentioned the faculty meeting, um, I used on the strategic vision. I thought this is how it has to be to uh, get to a certain point. And um, very nicely afterwards, people pointed out that there's a lot more history than I was aware. So. So you're sh demonstrating that. Yeah. Fantastic. And I hope I didn't offend anybody with a term. <laughs> no. What else? What's a value? Yes, you got one here. Absolutely. So how do you demonstrate trust? How do you? Okay, terrific. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Right, absolutely. Gosh, that's so important, right? We need every single person. Everybody brings something. Boy, I know in our college, 
our admin assistants, right? They don't have the highest title, but if, if, they, if they weren't there, we would collapse. I mean, they are the heart and soul, right? And understanding, appreciating, and letting people know how important their role is at any level, formal level, right? Because again, that leadership comes from anywhere. Yeah, what do you think? Of that critical thinking, trying to dig in. Okay, good. What else? Yeah, in the back. Okay. Okay, terrific. Yeah, you had one. Right, right. So, how are you demonstrating that? How are you? You're staying true to your values. Okay, excellent. Being that role model, that ethical orientation. Um, I've heard from recent mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want to um, touch on that because I'm really glad you brought that up because involvement is so important because involvement also helps tackle retention of membership. If you keep folks involved and engaged and they feel that their opinion, their voice is heard, whether a freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior, um, you keep them engaged and you keep them okay. They, even if the idea is not right on target, you kind of help them get that to where it needs to be, right? And so I, just my own, through my own personal um, experience, when I was a freshman in PRSSA, um, and I was also a freshman in um, the agency, um, student run agency, it was the upperclassmen just hearing that I wanted to be engaged. And they, and they also just let me just talk and let, not don't talk too much, not let them talk too much, but just let me put it out there and let me express myself. And so as upperclassmen, please keep that in mind is that you have younger folks who are in your organizations who are ex just excited to be there and you just might have to let them get it out and then let them feel involved and feel included in the conversation. So I really would challenge you to think, think about that next time you're in meetings and you just have those, those freshmen and sophomores in there who want to be included and involved. Thank you. Oh, we have another, Nicole. Uh, adventure. Adventure. Uh, you would say adventure. <laughs> <laughs> That one right here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just think for me, it's really important. It is. How do you demonstrate that? How do you show that? giving people the space to just, you know, brainstorm, yeah. right? There's yeah. no right, there's no wrong. Let's just throw stuff out there and, and play off of each other and then having the fun. Yeah, and then, you know, Doc, as leaders, we are the, 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 the maestros of creating uh, that space, right? And so right. we have to um, facilitate those different instruments of creativity and make sure they all work together yeah. as one big orchestra. And so keep that in mind, like, make sure, how do you, like, asking yourself, how are you fostering a space for your chapters it's for your members and your agency members to be creative. Terrific. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Innovation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so how are you going to demonstrate innovation in your chapter? Yeah. Okay. 
that's right. It's, you know, I, I think we tend to stay in the um, kind of the structure and the agenda that we were kind of brought up in, in the chapter, and this yep. is the way we do it week after week. And, you know, think, think bigger, think different. How do we mix that up? How do we change it up? What are some ideas to do it differently, right? Um, you have the opportunity to do that. Just because it's something you know, you don't have to stick. That's not the right way to do it. Right. It comes your way. Those are fantastic. Right. And so the power of self-reflection. Uh, as leaders, this is what we do, right? Like some leaders do it well, some leaders don't do it well. But after this, after this day, I want to make sure we all have the baseline so we can at least start and be able to do this, right? Mm -hmm. So self-reflection is really important, and by all means, Doc, you got it. Um, self-awareness self is so important of the ability to see ourselves clearly, right? And make sure, so a lot of times we, get, we, we do self-reflection, sometimes we're not 100% honest with ourselves. And sometimes um, honest, we're not um, totally honest, and sometimes we're too hard on ourselves. So we have to learn how to strike that appropriate balance where we're giving ourselves the, um, the, the room to make mistakes and to grow but also identifying ourselves, identifying where we're, what, um, what the opportunities are for our leadership styles and also for our teams. So some of the questions you ask is, you know, like how, how did everything work out? Did it work? If it, didn't, if it did not work, what were some of the opportunities for development there? So I often say that I don't say what are the strengths and weaknesses of my team, what are the strengths and the opportunities for development for my team? And so when you're able to put a positive, um, a, positive, a positive twist on what, what that is, you then begin to think about not weaknesses, but opportunities to help grow and help elevate those who you're leading. Um, um, Self-reflection is a primary way to examine ourselves and how others see us, right? And so it's, it's one thing to go ahead and do your own self-reflection, but are you asking yourself, how can I, who, do I, who can I ask? Who can I trust in my team? to give me the feedback, right? And give me the feedback that they're comfortable giving and give me the feedback that's a little uncomfortable. And allowing them the opportunity and the comfort of knowing that whatever feedback they share with you, you're gonna take it to heart. I mean, you, won't, you will not take it to heart. You will take it as something that's, you know, just something for you to work on. Because there's, there's many things that we feel we're strong at that we're really weak on. And so, I'm sorry, there are opportunities for development. And so being able to identify those and being able to really take time to work on those is what makes us better leaders. Because again, leadership is a journey. Remember that, leadership is a journey. And the more you know, the more you experience, the more you grow. But you will only grow if you're intentional about your growth. So meaningful self-reflection advances our emotional intelligence. So we talked about self-dynamics, one of the leadership dimensions of leaders around the world, right? Emotional intelligence is not just being able to understand yourself and your emotions and regulate those, but it's also being able to read others, right? That's where that whole listening and the nonverbals and all of that, you've heard about reading a room, right? So being able to adjust your communication style based on the feedback, and that's what we do, right? We put ourselves in the shoes of our target audience and we say, how can we reach them? How can we resonate with them? So being um, aware of ourselves and also aware of others and where they are. Now, I'll, I'll share something with you. And, and as Eric said, this is all just data points. Mm -hmm. These are all data points. So it, you, you may get some feedback and you may think, whoa, why in the world would that person think that about me? That's not the way I am. But instead of reacting emotionally, try not to take it personally. Try, this is what, this is what I, I like to think. How fascinating, how interesting that that person feels that about me, sees me that way. I had no idea, right? So if somebody comes to me and says, gosh, this happened and I think you, da, 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 right? And I'm like, oh, I'm thinking, my goodness, no, that's not what I meant. Blah, blah, blah. But I think, wow, oh my gosh, I, I had no idea. Can you, can you give me an example? Can you tell me more about that, right? So I may not agree with it. I may have my own perspective. It's a data point for you. Now, this is something that's kind of a couple really simple examples of emotional intelligence and data points. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would go to a restaurant oh, if I were alone, right, and I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'd be deep in thought. So I'm sitting at my table, and I'm sitting there, deep in thought. And what started happening is servers would start coming over to me, or the manager would say, ma'am, is everything okay? Right, because I'm sitting there like this. I'd be like, oh, oh yeah, everything's, everything's fine, right? So after this happened a few times, I realized 
that my nonverbal was like, oh, I'm upset, I'm mad, I'm right, when I was really just deep in thought. So now I temper that, right? If I'm sitting there, I try to temper that. And if I realize I'm doing it, I see the server and I'm like, oh. yeah, just give them a little, everything's fine, right? Little heads up. Now this also happened with a student. Um, one of my colleagues was telling me, you know, this, this student, you know, I'll, I'll call her Cheryl, said, you know, Cheryl, every time I would critique her video work, she has her arms crossed, she's sitting in the back, she's glaring at me. And this happened over and over. She said, so I finally went up to her and I said, look, Cheryl, you know, this is to make you better. This is why you're here, is to learn. Yeah, I know. Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't do it, I promise. <laughs> Maybe it turns off at the witching hour. I don't know. Um, so okay. she said, you know, Cheryl, you're here to get better, right? This is what, this is what it's about. It's not personal, right? And she said, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. She said, Cheryl, when you go out in the workplace, you can't, you can't act like that, right? Your boss is going to come down on you. They're going to get, you've got to be open to it. And, and she said, no, no. She said, I'm just processing what you're saying. I, I'm not mad at all. But that's just her nonverbal, right? So being aware, pick up on the data points. Everything you find, how fascinating, how curious. May not be what I think, but that's somebody else's perception. That is one of the elements of executive uh, presence is emotional intelligence, one of the keys, one of the pillars, right, of creating gravitas. Mm -hmm. It also deepens a critical thinking. That's what you were talking about, the, the, the questions, strategic decision-making skills, improves communications and strengthens relationship. Now, let's look at these. Okay, this is part of self-dynamics, strategic decision-making skills, communication, relationships. That right there are four of the six leadership dimensions common around the world of public relations leaders, self-reflection. Obviously, the more we are aware of others and ourselves, the better team members we can be and the better leaders. Yeah, and so make time for self-reflection and be honest with yourself. Uh, honesty is key here, and you must make time. So it's, 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 no, it's no point of you going through projects and rushing to the next thing without taking the time to understanding how it worked, uh, what worked well, what, what did not work well, and making sure you're allowing, the to, allowing your team to have the opportunity to self-reflect as well. And then come together and share what you, all came, what, you, what you all came up with. And in a positive, constructive environment, be able to share that information and share, and share lessons learned with others so you can be able to figure out what, when, when you do it the next time or when they have the opportunity to do it the next time and lead, you have those best practices already established, already identified. How did, how did you, how did your team performance make you feel? What went, so I talked about what went well, what did you learn from the experience? And seek out feedback from others, right? And mentors are very important here. I'm really loud, can somebody turn me down? Mentors are really important here. And the re reason being because mentors, again, we talked about how they give you that, that, that reflection of yourself um, from a lens that you did not recognize or things, or they pretty much show, show you some things that you didn't think were there or present. They identify some, some areas of opportunity that you were too close to the project to identify yourself. Um, create the right mindset and don't judge yourself too hard. Remember, relax. You're still early on. You all are still in PRSSA. You're still in school. Give yourself the room to grow and the grace to grow, and the grace to grow great, okay? Um, and it's all about getting better and be grateful for feedback. And so it's nothing worse than asking for feedback. You get the feedback. It's not the feedback you're expecting, and now you're, now you're all griping about it. That's going to make the person who gave you the feedback think twice about giving you the feedback. Some feedback is constructive feedback. We talked about that earlier, right? And some feedback is not so helpful. You still say thank you for that feedback as well, because at the end of the day, it's feedback. And you just learn to apply what is necessary and toss away what is not. But be mindful and honest with yourself, even if it's not something I wanted to hear, was something I needed to hear. Okay. Yes, Jasper? I would like to say, um, I usually say, look at feedback as a gift. Mm -hmm. uh, they invest in their own um, um, credibility and those things uh, to relate their relationship to you in, uh, in giving you feedback. It's much easier for them to say nothing. Um, one of the most difficult things I can tell you as an international student, for example, when I came over, it took me about two years to realize how people perceived me. I was in Borgoga. 
and I finally talked to my best uh, friend, and roommate to uh, tell me the truth, and he basically said she looked like a dog. <laughs> so it was a really important information. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, and, and one thing about feedback is you just, as as you continue to grow in your careers and you grow in your um, spending your time, you're going to lead. You all are going to be um, communication leaders. I see vice presidents. I see uh, directors. I see all this in this room. But the thing about feedback is you have to apply it. And it's no. It's, it, what's the point of you getting feedback and you don't apply the lessons learned that were shared with you? You actually move, you actually do yourself a disservice if you do that, and people are then again reluctant to hope to share feedback with you. However, when you do the opposite, get the feedback and apply the feedback, and then go back to the person who shared it with you on, on, on different terms and say, you know, I heard you. And this is some of the actions that I took along the way, and these are the results that I've gotten from those from that feedback. It then makes them it then makes them again more vested in you, and one it, it shows them that you're more mature um, than you know, what your age calls for. And as young professionals, that is so important to really, really um, mark how much our maturity, right? Because folks always have the things to say about millennials, right? Right. I'm millennial as well. So, but the way we combat that is going against what the status or what the general, the generalization of millennials are. So, receive the feedback, get, um, make, make the applicable changes. And then go ahead and say, you know what, I heard you. Thank you, thank you for that feedback. And because you gave me that, I was able to do X, Y, and Z, and, I, and, I, and I, I've seen and experienced X, Y, and Z results because of that feedback. And then you might end up sparking a new mentor who's then invested, if not, if, maybe not, not even a mentor, but somebody who's going to sponsor you to that next level and say, having a conversation behind closed doors, say, you know what, let me tell you about that kid. <laughs> they, they messed up this assignment. I gave them feedback. It was hard feedback. They took it. They ran with it. They applied it. They tried it again, and it made it work. This person is worth doing X, Y, and Z for. Those are the conversations you want to you want to happen behind your back, not the opposite. I gave that kid feedback. Did nothing with it. They're not ready, right? That's how we move up. We show. We demonstrate how we demonstrate. Now we say we demonstrate how we're ready. Mm -hmm. And we, we did have a TED Talk here, but because of the time, we're not going to play it. But I encourage you, it's on self-reflection. Um, it's a, a woman named Tasha Yurik who gives it. Um, she's, she's young. And she um, basically kind of one of the key takeaways from her research, she's researched self-reflection and how it can help us and make us better leaders, et cetera. One of, her, one of her key takeaways is not to ask the question why, why do, why do I feel this way? Why did it happen to me? Why am I, aren't I good enough? But to ask the question, what? What's important to me? What can I learn from this, right? So when you start to think about in your self-reflection the why questions, change it to what, okay? And watch her video. It's, it's yep. much more, um, it's, it makes a lot more sense when you hear it from her and yep. her research. And here's some ways that you build in general, and build genuine, authentic relationships on your teams. Genuine, authentic relationships on your team. I, I emphasize genuine and authentic because it's been my experience in my short time in this communications world that we get so caught up in PR, we get so caught up in like making connections and trying to figure out how to leverage strengths so we can move ahead. But you move ahead when you generate genuine and authentic relationships when people know who you are and also know what you can do. And so it, 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 is, it is that. And so again, just asking questions, asking questions, taking the notes, um, um, applying the feedback. Listen, 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 listen. Um, be empathetic. Treat them as equals. Um, your team, even though you are a leader, you do not have to boast about the fact that you are the president or you're the agency director. Matter of fact, if that's something that you feel empowered that you must say to your team, you need to ask yourself, what are you doing wrong? Because a good leader, leaders do not have to like, tout what their titles are. Because again, it's just a title that somebody else can easily have. Leaders understand that they're invested in their teams. And if your, your team sees that investment in them, they will then respect the authority of your office. Um, be vulnerable when necessary. I talked about sometimes it's not always great to say to share what's, what you did well 
what you succeeded in. Be transparent and let your team know when you failed. Be transparent when you didn't come through like you said you were going to come through. And, sh and also share how you're going to improve and what the next steps you're going to take to make sure it doesn't happen again. As leaders, you have to set the standard for how you want those following you to follow, to follow suit. And so in doing that, so be vulnerable. Give credit. It's not all about you. Matter of fact, you should never take credit for anything. It's all about your team, right? Prioritize. Because again, let me go back to this When you give credit, it's all about your team. The folks who see you, the folks who's watching from a distance, they're realizing that, okay, he understands, this, he or she understands his quality and knows that that's, that's an executive, that's, that's a vice president, that's a director, that's somebody who's going places because they understand the real core and the real foundation of what teamwork really is about. Prioritize. Make sure that you have the prioritization of what things are important to you, your organization, your vision, and make sure you're, you, you're, you're able to communicate that and your team is bought in and, and on board of what the priorities of your team and your, of your vision for the organization or the agency is. Be available. This is hard to do because you're a student, probably they have 12, 15, 16, 18 credit hours of classwork, and you also have, probably have a, a part-time job, an internship. You're leading, you're leading the PR, to say, or agency. You're on a sorority or fraternity. You're doing a whole bunch of stuff. You're trying to graduate, right? You're trying to get a job. You're interviewing. You, you don't know what's going on, what you're going to do next. You're trying to go to grad school. There's like a lot of things going on. But when you said, I do to being a leader, you also said you want to make time for your team. So remember that. The, it is great to put it on your resume that you're the president, vice president, director, agency director, whatever for your organization. But it means, it means, it means way more that later on down the line, we have to see that person you were leading in the agency uh, organization, uh, PRSA chapter, or whatever, in the career, who's going to remember the way you treated them. Because people, people always remember the way you make them feel. And so they may be in a position where they, they're, they're making a decision on hiring you or vouching for you for a role. So always be available to your team members because at the end of the day, it's not about you, it's about your team. Um, and it's, it's okay. I understand it, I get it, I was there, I was stretched thin as well. But one thing about it is you, I always, always stress that no matter what was going on, no matter what the time is, I need to be available to my team. And, and be quite honest, with, like, if, you, if you build these skill sets now, they're only going to serve you as you continue to move through your career and move up. And you're going to be known not as the great PR say president, but the great vice president, the great chief communications officer, the great CEO, the person who we can always depend on, the person who people who are running to be on their team, right? Because that's really how you, like people want to, people who want to work under you, that's how you, that's how you show value that oh, there's something about this young lady and this young man that fosters and attracts incredible talent that makes great, better work for us long, 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 long term in the future. So it's not, we're talking about it right now, the level as being a student, but figure out how these, these, how these leadership lessons are going to apply to you as you move through your careers. Set aside time for one-on-ones and enjoy each person for who they are. You all are young professionals, young professionals, getting ready to enter the workforce, so enjoy the space. Enjoy the space together. Enjoy the hard work, the late nights, the fundraising events, the writing pitches, the writing press releases, doing coursework together. Um, be, the tightest, be, the, be the tightest group of, in, of young professionals together. So when you all go off to your different places and your different roles, you always have that resource to lean on to when something goes wrong or something goes well, and you have opportunity to bring somebody else up. And so this is, this is our last, um, really our, our last slide today. And that is again for you to reflect, right? A little bit of self-reflection. So I want you to write down, based on what you've heard, what you've learned, what you've looked at today, what is one thing you're gonna start doing in your next team environment? So moving into your next team meeting, work group, whatever it may be, what is one thing from today you're gonna start doing then what is one thing you're going to stop doing? And what is one thing you're going to continue to do? Something you're already doing that seems to be working well. Start, stop, continue. Yep, I saw that. <laughs> My little picture here.
in the handout packet that we gave you, there's also um, a piece called Team Leaders Guidelines from the Plank Center. And it's amazing It is a great resource, resource for you to also, as you're self-reflecting, to go through those, that checklist, right? It goes, when through four, it starts with self-reflection. Guess what? It ends with self-reflection yeah. as you go through that. So when you look at that, you may decide to add something else. Mm -hmm. to what you're going to start doing or what yeah. you're going to continue to do. And Doc, if I may, I would love to say, if you have not already, check out the Plank Center's website. As a young professional, it is so helpful. The articles, the research, the, the tools, the information that are on, that's on the Plank Center website that the Plank Center um, overall generates, it is career changing. And so definitely take, and like, as, as young pros, you are always supposed to be looking for something that's going that you can feed yourself take you to the next level. And that's one recommendation that I would have for you is to take a look, serious look at what the Plank Center is putting out and seeing how you can apply that in your in your day-to-day -day leadership tasks and also to your teams, your careers, and everything moving forward. There is a LinkedIn group, of course. Mm -hmm. We know Betsy Plank Day is coming up as well. It is birthday, coming up, right? yes. And so, um, yeah, and follow on Twitter and you're going to have access to a lot mm -hmm. of people, a lot of resources, uh, and make connections with people like Eric. Terrific. Uh, we've gone two full hours. You're probably feeling it. Uh, so uh, rather than take questions, you know, one on one, know that we're up here for a little bit longer. If you guys want to come up, okay. We got one one more piece of business first, Emily. Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. But we're around if you guys want to chat anymore. Thank you. It was an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, you guys are awesome. Enjoy the rest of your wired and wonderful. Yeah. Two hours. Yeah. Um, so again, we're just doing a little evaluation for us to get some feedback about our like speaker sessions today from you guys. Um, but really, this does conclude our first day. So we want to thank you guys for being here and sharing this time with us. And we're so excited to like talk to you guys and everything and meet you a little bit more along the weekend. So. Feel free to disperse back to the hotel. If anyone's looking for like dinner and things like that, you can always talk to all of our West Virginia members. We'd love to hang out with you guys. So. And can we take a moment to give a hand for the conference planning committee? Yeah. Having done a great job so far. It's been an amazing conference. Absolutely. Thank you guys.